in the Course of Miracles it says that the slightest irritation when magnified is murder and that murderous thoughts, attack thoughts are the essence of what upset is that you need to attack and defend to protect your peace and at a relative level well, that's true you know if you're living in a country where there's coups and or you're living in a family where there's domestic violence or you're living in a education system where there's abuse of authority it's it's very challenging not to be taken in by those stories and make yourself a victim of them i remember my mentor had spent a lot of time in silence and he was a very 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 peaceful man babies would be brought into the room crying and they just stop his presence would would impact them in that way and I was on a university degree where you know I'll, I'll, I'll just segue for a second but I'm I'm living on beef right now I just eat beef and I'm in a tropical part of the world on the equator or near the equator and so when I cook like all these flies come because they're very much drawn to by, by, by their biology to the smell of, of, of rotting flesh but it's not rotting flesh it's cooking flesh but it's it's dead flesh right and that's their job in the ecosystem and when I was on this university degree like this statement you're never upset for the reason you think, which is in the Course in Miracles, and irritation magnified is murder, right? So <laughs> those things have percolated down to the core of my being. And for the most part, I'm an extremely peaceful person. But I noticed when The reflections of those incubated thoughts were brought into this university room. There was a huge amount of neurosis in the room, both among the professors and among the students. And the ego survives by attack and defense thoughts. If, if they fall away, the ego dies, right? And so when I was communicating about you know my experiences I was doing it in a very calm way and the neurosis that was in the room um, was dressed up in like I'm a victim of the world I see I'm a woman I'm a victim of the world I see I'm I'm a, a, a black woman or I'm a victim of the world I see how dare this man talk about his experiences and have an opinion about what women experience because he's not a woman it was just like all of these attacks and so it you, you don't know what the response to your journey is going to be like and in the sense of what happened as a consequence of that like, I realized, I witnessed all this anger and sense of unfairness come up in me. And it, at the level of the ego story, that was completely justified, right? I was made out to be a misogynist. I was made out to be a racist. Just by one woman. And then it, like, she, she you know, and, and I was made out to be homophobic. None of which is remotely close to the truth of who I am. But my self-concept, having to handle that abuse like that projection of a false story onto me, was very hurt by it. And so I thought I'd gone a long way into developing, you know, equanimity and peace of mind. 
And this was a big slap in the face. And then I had to, you know, I had to look at how the majority of the world is very wounded. It's very caught in the dream of this, you know, in the Bible it says, Adam fell asleep, it never said that he woke up. So we live in this illusionary world. We live in the illusionary world and we take it to be real. And we get our fangs out when people threaten us. Or we feel the presence of that peace. You know, peace can be both threatening and uh, healing. It depends. It depends how we choose to respond. And in the sense of that, that was a horrific experience for me. It was. It was essentially a deepening. Because I saw that, you know, a lot of professional psychotherapists are completely asleep. They, they put on the aura of being calm, but there, there's all these ego battles going on inside them. And so to enter that arena with some pretty wounded healers, right, was a reflection of my need to look at my wounded healer. And the, the wounded healer, the phrase healer is a bit of a misnomer. There's a story of Empedocles, who was the, the father of the idea of the atom. And it's a mythological story, but everyone, there was a woman that went to every healer she could in in ancient Greece and none of them could heal her of her a physical issue I can't remember what it was but finally she goes to Empedocles and Empedocles heals her and he he sees that as the end of his journey as a healer and in the myth of his life he then climbs up Mount Vesuvius and jumps in the volcano and the volcano throws out one of his sandals or two of his sandals and it's sort of like the symbolism of that when the mind is healed, the echoes of their healing thoughts walk on with us. They, they walk along with us, you know, and that was the symbol of the sandal. And you have a similar set of symbolisms around sandals and shoes in, in India. But the, the, the misnomer of the healer is that your job is to heal others and i don't think that's at all what a healer is about that's how we think of doctors and so forth um and i'm not condemning any of that there's a lot of pragmatism and intelligence to you know the the medical profession but at the level of the deepest inquiry into what is a healer it is not someone that's trying to heal others because there are no others. Of course, there are others in the world, but there are no others in terms of the illusion. Like the illusion, one seen from outside, is an illusion of separation, of fear, of one of the best phrases I know for it is a sugar coated turd, right? Because there's pleasure and there's fleeting moments of joy. But there's always depression, pain and death, right? There's always this sense of upset until the mind is healed. And so, you know, the story of Empedocles is on one level, it's, um, it's inspiring. It goes into the fires of his bodily extinguishment healed in his mind, right? And he can heal the the sickest person that no one else in the kingdom can touch, no one else can come close to. And so he's transcended the wounded healer archetype, which is a, a, a big problem in psychotherapy circles, in yoga circles, in spiritual teacher circles, because, you know, the most popular teachers are often you know, pandering to a very superficial aspect of what healing is. But they meet the masses where they want to be heard, you know, they, they want to, they want to, you know, 
support attack thoughts and they want to support their national identity or their their belief system identity. Or they want to get something, you know, they want to get some material benefit or they want to get some favor from God. And so the healers in inverted commas that promise them such boons are very popular because they, they want this idea that there's a benevolent God out there and it will, it, that benevolent God will improve the quality of their life. But the, the wounded healer archetype is, is, is a stage to go beyond. It's this idea that I'm here to fix others. That's a lie. You're here to fix your perception of others and self. And so, you know, your outer experience with people, there's babies stopping crying, or people attacking you. It's, a, it's always a part of what, from spirit's point of view, is perfect. It's a perfect set of steps. It's like, okay, that guy had gotten to a very peaceful place myself i was hardly ever angry in fact i can't remember prior to that abuse at the university when i was angry you know there's some slight upset some slight irritation now and again very rarely and then i'm like crucified and i'm like angry with my family i'm angry with the system that supported the abuse I'm not angry going up to people and saying, hey, you want to fight? Not that kind of anger. I get away from the insanity. I don't, I'm smart enough not to go and, you know, I just report the abuse to the authorities. And I am filed several complaints against the authorities that supported the abuse. But then I go away and I have somewhat of a depression, somewhat of a crisis. I'm sick physically in those experiences at that time, still getting over it, long COVID and so forth. And then my psoriasis had gotten a lot worse. I've been alienated from my family. They, you know, if you get raped or you have a hate crime happen to you as I did, those are very challenging experiences. And like my sister was just like, oh, get out of the victim mind, right? And it was like, there was no compassion in the way she spoke. And that caused me a lot of ill feeling toward her. But then I'm never upset for the reason I think. Murder is the slightest irritation magnified. So you step back and you see that all these wounded people, you know, they only have two ways of handling that, those wounds. Attack and defend the wounds, protect the pain mechanism. So you, you recognize that, you know, the most profoundly peaceful, happy people are both an enormous threat and the source of all relative meaning in the universe, depending on how we experience them. And then when you think you get to a plateau where I've really got a handle on this peace business, where I've really got a handle on seeing my irritation for what it is, and you get crucified, whoa, that's a test, you know? And then all this unconscious victimhood comes up. And it's a gift, it's a hell of a gift. It's a gift that's like, if you're not very careful, it will lead to malicious prejudice. Malicious prejudice has been put on you. And that's the meaning of turn the other cheek. It doesn't mean be holier than thou. 
it means stop falling into the trap of the lie.